I'm Joy Sri Roy, a member of the fifth um, Prince Sultan bin Aziz um, Award for Water in 2012 laureate team. Uh, currently, I'm Bangabandhu Chair Professor at the Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand, and also I'm a Professor of Economics at Jadupur University in India. I really thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts and my work with the August audience. Uh, the presentation which I'm going to speak on is about water or health, where to put the money. Uh, I always feel that, you know, this is going to be the decisive decade, 2021 to 2030, because fortunately or unfortunately, we are starting this decade with handsome financial resources on the table of the decision makers and investors, a minimum of 12 to 14 trillion COVID recovery package money. With the tagline attached though, that build back better, and also with a constant reminder from the scientific community of the 2030 targets under the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. What do we know about the water and health nexus from scientific evidence and ground reality? I'm just giving you some facts. There are much more which we can go on adding, but these are from the WHO website, World Health Organization's website. It's globally 15% of patients in any hospital develop an infection during a hospital stay because of lack of water infrastructure. 2,195 children die of common diarrhea every day, 365 days around the year. Cancer claims more than 26,000 lives every day. And 200 million people drink arsenic-laced water in the absence of access to safe drinking water and lives with the highest possible risk of getting cancer. Some more facts from Indian continent where what we have done is using the official statistics, we tried to map the different states in India where we are trying to show that what is the population coverage through the safe drinking water? The negative, the light blue, means that uh, these states have access to water less than the India average. And the dark blue ones are having access with more than India average. And in the right hand side, we are showing the states with incidence of diarrhea and the number of patients per thousand population. From that, the negative shows those who are having less than, I mean, the incidence of the diarrhea less than the India average and rest are having 
uh, the diarrhea incidence above India average. So if you map them together, if you superimpose, you can see that the areas with less access to safe drinking water are the areas who are the more sufferers of diarrhea. Another fact, ground reality, when we measured from the Kolkata Municipal Corporation, the mega city in India, where we measured the pipe to water supply of the municipality throughout the, um, the year in different seasons. We actually got this data for 365 days and tried to know what is the percentage of confluent in the water samples collected from the pipe to water supply. We see that during the summer months, the confluent increases, which means the water gets contaminated, even if it is going through the pipe to water system to the households. So which simply means with climate variability going more towards the warming, this water quality impact in the cities of the mega cities are going to be of uh, crossing the danger limit. So another aspect which we cannot deny in any city is the water and the injustice around water. This is again from the same city of Kolkata in India where we tried to see that how many households are having access to the pipe water supply. We see that high income group has and the middle income group and uh, the have the higher share of the piped water supply. But if we look into the below poverty line population, they do not have even a single water connection in their homes. And if we look into the disease burden, then we see that the, the marginally poor and the below poverty line people have the highest incidence of total waterborne diseases in their households. So waterborne disease, so a health problem arising from multiple waterborne disease is exclusively related to the safe drinking water access. And also we looked into how people use for purification of their water. We can see in the high income group, there is more purification. That is they boil the water or they filter the water, which means that there is a high energy water nexus and health impact compared to the BPL households where there is almost no purification method applied. And so the incidence of diseases are also more. So this is, I'm talking about the mega city, right? So in the urban areas, this is the uh, injustice and the uh, health disease burden that we are living with just because there is not access to safe drinking water. So, but if we, we did the study with the households and we tried to see that how people react. So uh, do the poor people really aspire for good quality water? We did a willingness to pay survey. And we found that poorer the people with less access, they're ready to pay even more for better quality of water, but then high income group who has already better access, their willingness to pay is less. So we can also see how this social power structure also uh, impacts their willingness to pay, given that who has better access in the whole system. And if we look into the unaccounted for water, very interestingly, we will see that for drinking water, you know, we all know that uh, the human body needs a particular level of um, you know, consumption, and that is almost the same in the uh, below poverty line and the high income group. But look at the other end uses. 
it's more than double. And so this is only which I'm just showing the unaccounted for water, right? So this is something which we need to understand that unaccounted for water is higher with the high income groups. So if we want to know for this injustice and wastage of water, how much the society is bearing the cost because wastage means we have spent um, money and also energy or electricity for water treatment. And so how much of those are getting wasted? So we are putting these in terms of Indian rupees. And so we can show that per day there is loss of 800,000 Indian rupees because of the wastage of water in the treated uh, water supply system. And electricity lost is again another 100,000 units because of the uh, electricity that has been gone in for water treatment and that is getting wasted. So these are the costs the society is paying. So just Keep this in mind, and then I'm trying to show you a little more uh, information that this is about, we wrote two books about the arsenic contamination and what it implies for uh, you know, the people in the same uh, state of West Bengal where Calcutta is a city. So it is from the same uh, uh, socioeconomic background which I'm trying to bring in, and this is the work, I mean, uh, a previous work on this was actually acknowledged by Prince Sultan bin Aziz Award. So we carried forward the work after the, um, uh, uh, I mean, award, because that was an encouragement for us. And then we could find that actually people are suffering from different kind of skin diseases and that finally leads to loss of their amputation of their um, hands or legs and then this has a huge health cost on them. So we wanted to know just a very simple exercise of willingness to pay and then we could see that the cost of cure, if you want to cure them by medical treatment, it will be costing um, more than almost four times than what it costs for preventing the disease by providing access to safe, arsenic safe drinking water. So it is clearly that preventive cost is much less than the cost of cure. So I started with the question where to put the money for social benefit. Who could have taught us much better, if not COVID-19, that prevention is better than the cure? Because direct cost to an individual, if I just bring in again from the same city, what is the cost of medical bill if someone got infected during this past one year, then it costs at least 100,000 Indian rupees in two weeks. And what is the preventive measure? We all can calculate, right? And so this also shows that how prevention is much better than cure. So the question comes, so how to build back better? So do we invest more on health sector or do we invest more on the water sector? It simply means that we have traversed a long way and now come to a point on the road where we need to decide which of the two entry points we need to take. We all try to make informed decision, especially when it involves well-being of 7 billion people. So best decision is definitely least costly solution, economically, socially, and environmentally. We have already seen some statistics. I will just give you this uh, 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 I mean flow chart to show that if we look into the climate variability and how it is going to impact the temperature, humidity, and extreme events, then maybe we can control the climate change and prevent it and prevent its impact on heat stress and impact on vector and waterborne diseases and health damage. 
or we allow all this to continue and then health damage happens, people get sick, and then we try to do the medical expenditure and then try to see that how that loss of benefit can be managed by treating the sickness. But we know that we have already shown that how prevention is less costly than the cure. Even in case of climate change, we have seen that prevention is less costly than cure and prevention has more um, uh, co-benefits in terms of multiple other benefits, just not the health damage benefit. So question comes to build it better, what we should avoid. We should avoid some policies which are creating distortions in the societal system and which leads to wrong incentive. Say, for example, if you have some kind of incentive where it is not the volumetric charge for water, but it's a flat rate, then there is no incentive for waste reduction. And we have seen that how wastage of water leads to more cost of burden on the society. Similarly, that avoids the efficiency uh, uh, rule also. So the least cost option can never be achieved. And we have seen how distributive justice is violated. And so another question comes. So we know that for water, who collects water? in the rural areas. We know it's the women, it's the girls who are engaged in that. In one sense, this gives them some kind of ownership of caring for their family and home and makes them makes their position in the home stronger and empowers them because of this uh, activity. But I'm not saying that this burdensome work really need to continue with them. But what it really means is that the rural water supply systems are changing and uh, promising sustainable systems are coming so that it's less labor time needed. But the question is, is this gender inclusive? Just look at this. This has been uh, removing all the women from the ownership of the water. So this is something which we need to understand that how women empowerment can go hand in hand when we build the sustainable solutions. So the question comes how to develop. So there is need for a paradigm shift we know through genuine investment. When we talk of genuine investment, we want to say that it needs to take care of an investment which takes care of societal justice, the economic justice and the environmental justice. And from that point of view, I'm just trying to show you that if we just follow the sustainable development goals, which are set for and which has been agreed upon politically by all the countries, by the decision makers, if we follow the sustainable development goal six, which is on water, but my submission is that our research shows it's just not when making an investment decision. We need not only focus on SDG 6, but we need to focus on few other, um, uh, uh, other SDGs, which is part of um, yeah, the uh, SDG 2, which is the target number 2.4, like this, 15.1, 15.2, 15.8, and we can go on. And what it simply says is that all these are showing how to take preventive measure in the water sector to make it um, you know, a preventive care rather than um, a cure-based economic investment decision. Because we have already show, seen that if we invest in water, it is less burdensome on the society. And if we save money socially, then we can invest it in another because there is always a scarcity of financial resources. So making the best possible decision is the best. So I always say that we need to take SDG 6 plus approach in thinking of the investment in the water sector uh, during the COVID recovery period. And so what we need is when I started with that, we have 
we are sitting with the money and how to build back better, my answer will be that we need to uh, prioritize water for preventive action sector rather than the cure-based health sector investment. And that prioritization will always give us a better health outcome and we can produce a better human health just by spending on preventive action in the water sector. And we have seen that cure action by investing in pharmaceutical industry and hospitals does not lead to cost effective solution and justice in the society. So what we did is we just made uh, some rough calculations and we chose that only if we spend 0.5 trillion US, 50% of the global population aspiring for dignified living with basic services, we can create no less than 200 million new jobs in this decade, and we can avoid any future pandemic with multi-layered damage whose cost is well above 3.5 trillion in a global economy of today means 2019 and 2020, when the value of the global economy was 86 trillion US dollar. And if we compare this with our COVID-19 um, solid, I mean the recovery fund, then it is 12 to 14 million and we need just 3 million to solve the problem once for all for the whole global population so that everybody can have a better health through investment in water sector. So if we are asking that, is COVID-19 on a collision course with 2030 sustainable development goal utopia? Yes, 50% of the world population who lives in South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia, majority do not have access to safe drinking water, let alone 24 into seven water service flow. So COVID-19 is indeed in a collision course with utopia, but it is upon us to not to make it so, and we need a collective action. We need both blue and green economy to thrive for our survival. You can visit our space, changeframing.space, where we have more information. Thank you very much. Uh, you would like to thank the organization of the conference and also the members of the Council of the Prince Sattam bin Abdelaziz International for Water for the invited me to give this kind of the lectures, which it is announced as recognized as the Creativity Prize 2020 Prince Sattam bin Abdelaziz International for Water. Today, I would like briefly to talk about how the nano solutions can save drinking water. And in particular, we are manufacturing cost effective nanoporous material and membrane filters to save drinking water from all pollutants. And it can make a high revolution and the breakthrough for, I mean, removing and the contamination of the water. Uh, my name is Sharif Al Safti. I am professor of nanomaterial nano. Engineering, National Institute of Material Science. If you come to the humanity top problems in the world wide, you could find the water is one of the big theme. And in, I mean, in all mankind and in all countries, regardless developing country or non-developing countries. So nowadays, the nanotechnology come forward to show something. Uh, which we expected it is very very good actually and it is a promising in the 21st century to treat the waters and health care and environment and the green energy and the food quality and the poverty of course this is some of the i mean top problems that faces the humanity everywhere so we we talk about the i mean giant revolution of the nanomaterials and the membranes usually the water is one of the big issues. If anyone going to travel anywhere or he just has a bottle of the water, he usually 
the chick's ingredient. And the, coming to his, I mean, his mind always, is this water safe to drink? I mean, is this uh, bottling water or the tap water, the water safe to drink? So it is very, very good questions to ask yourself about this one, just to know how the quality of water can be. So water pollution is a big issue, as I said, in the, I mean, in the worldwide pollutions lead to unsafe drinking waters. So if you talk about the pollutant sources from the waters, this is a huge amount of the pollution released to the waters. I mean, even it's coming from the brackish water or surface waters or the desalination water itself. I mean, sea waters. So the people use this kind of drink water at the moment in the world, right? particularly in the Middle East, the desalination, one of the big issue and one of the big concern. So what can you imagine if this water has been contaminated even in the ultra level of the concentrations is part per billions, I mean, very, very, very small amount. And even this ultra, I mean, traces of this kind of contaminants like arsenic or lead can do to dangerous things for the mankind. And this is, is a World Health Organization announcement it is not new, I mean, announcement, but can you imagine is 80% of diseases for, I mean, originated from unsated waters. Up to now, around 2 billion or 2 million of the people die because the contaminations in the waters. So the water source, can you imagine more than two and a half billions of the people, they don't have access for the sanitation systems, I mean, very, very important matters. I mean, to drink, I mean, pure water. So this is a big issue actually in the, any governmental or local governmental or any union in the world body to consider about how they can save the water from any kind of the pollutions. So a lot of things we can say, the goal of this, our innovations is nano for safe drinking water. This is just only the brief of some, my concern and my talk today. So giant revolution of manufacture, I'm going to introduce this one, of the nanomaterial and self-standing membrane, as well as the cutting edge for the quality and the safety of the waters with the high production capacity. And this is, is one of the main concern in our life. You can say this lecture is the types of the invention translation from bench to mark. I can't say no commercialization, but it can reach you to this one. But I can say a way to this innovations. So the technology process and design for us is very important. This is our lecture based on this slide. So home materials is hierarchical order materials. It's HOM. We kill, we I mean we called it as HOM. This is abbreviations. So home material fabrication, we, we, we I'm, I'm coming to introduce very simple, I mean, process. What is the potential of this? I mean, materials and uh, in the waters. How we could manufacturing the membrane, this material, I mean, nanomaterials in membranes and make giant mess self sanding membranes and how this membrane can integrate it in any kind of the water treatment plant from brackish waters or whatever is desalination or whatever, or even the home filters. I mean, small unit of this one. So, a manufacturing of home innovation, usually the, the self-standing is what we call it is a monolith like. So we don't prepare material as a powder, it's a monolith, it takes shape and something. As you can see in this one is the marketing of Japan, is looks like sugar like, or salt, because this is make high filtration, high flow rates filtration. In the same time, this material itself, it has a lot of nano scale structures like nanowires or so, as you can see, and a lot of porous materials. So this is unique porous monolith. So please take the word monolith. Monolith is mean a material, take a shape or any, I mean, catheter. If you cast it in, in anything else, it takes the shape of anything else. It looks like the Egyptian sphinx is like, this is like monolith type. Or we, 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 we I mean, the human is a monolith type in, 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 in macro scale. So the, the, it is very, very simple to prepare this one. It is with dry 
processing with various hierarchical configurations. As you can see, this is, is like billets and um, comb and um, any nano wire, nano roots, cage, and something like this one. So the material itself has a lot of porous shape itself. It's not only the, the, the I mean the morphological configurations, but it's, itself it has something like like cylinder porous material shapes in the cube three dimensional material or cavity like this, or even though it is a unique channels along long range area. I mean in in the material itself, and at the same time this material is is you could use it by your hand, and it can be used as a membrane as you can see. And it has a huge surface area, this material, as you can see here. This is one of the great, I mean, forces for us. It's not a gram material. It is, you can make it mass scale, I mean. In our lab, we could make, I mean, 100 grams, one kilo, for example. But there is a lot of the company considering or doing that one at the moment. So this material is kept with 100, more than 1,000 meters square. I mean, a huge surface area. Billions of pore volumes. And the containers, massive of the reactive surface sites, and this is very, very important, as you can see in this, I mean, video. And it is, has non-porous like mouse caves and the channels and the, a lot of things, as you can see. This one is, I mean, Japanese technology in the 21st century. I'm so proud about this kind of the designs. If you come to see how we could change the nanoscale materials, I can't say we are the first, but we can say we are one of the people who are considering how we could deliver this kind of the innovations to public people and, I mean, developing countries. So we started to make like mass scale. I mean, a lot of company compares like this. And as you can see here, the material, it can be a lot of materials and it can be backed like this is the process that I would like to, I mean, it, it just only slide to show up how we could manage or control the mass scale manipulation. So the question, second question is, what is the power of the nano home? As I said, home is hierarchical order material in a molossi innovations. What is the power of this materials in the water, particularly in the water? I'm talking about the water only today. So what is the function of the home in the water? It is, I mean, one of the great breakthrough what I started as one, we have a technology to decontaminate the radioactive substance. If it is released in any kind of the massive action like what happened in Japan in the 20, I mean, uh, 11, as you can see here, this is, it was in March 11, 2011. It was Friday day and I was in my institute and it was big disaster in that times. And the tsunami coming from, I mean, the ocean about 15 meters height and it was very, very big disaster actually. And the, the, the Fukushima nuclear plant is, was exposed and the radioactives was released in the water and in the air and in the soil. It was really big disaster in that time. So we work hardly according to the governmental vision in Japan to make something. And after a while, six months or one year, Alhamdulillah, we got the, one of the great things is, is, as you can see, the announcement and the press release in, the, in media is a huge actually is clean up breakthrough for the radioactive materials. So the idea, how the idea was built in, I mean, how the, I mean, the home material can build in, from this diagram or from this scheme, you can see how we control the material and the active site of the materials here, and how we could build the material, the same as the active sites, and the same times we can build a structure, a radical structure, like towers of the materials. A lot of the vacant of the room it can swallow and absorb and capture, as you can see here, that one, all treatment processes in, 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 one, in one step. And this is very great things. I mean, you can't control the detection and absorption and the capture and the filtration and the recycling after and the collection of the waste, as you can see here. And then reuse the material again and again. I'm talking about the materials, which is, will be transferred uh, later on in the membrane in my talk. So this is just only to understand how we can make, I mean, collect the radioactive or toxins from the waters and not to release it again to the environment. It can be used, actually, it can be used very, very effective. So as well as how can you reduce the volume of this one? Coming to the true thing is in, in Fukushima area, as you can see, massive 
area contaminated, we in Japan we collected all of these radioactive. You have about uh, 40 kilo or something, 60 kilo. Uh, it's really contaminated area. So we collect the stuff and we try to treat this kind, as you can see here. And this is, is announced by the inventor stop. I mean, uh, spot how we treat this kind of the nuclear active materials contaminated with this one. So as you can see here, the radioactive cleanup process at Fukushima. I mean, if this is wasted in the world or anything, and it comes to the water, so we release it to the waters like this. This is, is condensed radioactive. And this is, is, I mean, one of them, it can go and do, I mean, like pilot plant or mobile station can go by this one. But can you imagine this is, is I mean, the dose, I mean, becquerel of the, I mean, cesium, for example, which is very, very important. There, the cesium change, I mean, it was iodine and then strontium and then the radioactive become like cesium and was very, very difficult. And then it is 4,000 becquerel, which is very, very dangerous. And you can see in the world, in something like this, and it reached to down of the level of anything. And this is a detection. This is the home materials with the active sites. And then after capturing and it takes the cesium, it gives signaling. And this is his numerical things. So you can understand the water is still contaminated by cesium or the water is already, I mean, I mean, pure. There is no cesium free in our waters. So one of the great things during this technology is what I'm, I'm showing you now. This is, is around the turbine, I mean, turbine waters, we, because this is very, very dangerous and the water is, is boiled there. So as you can see here, this is, is the new, I mean, normal one. I mean, any current in the water, I mean, in the world, wide, it can be released, that one. Then they use the filter like this one, but actually it's very difficult, I mean, to mention this one. So our technology is based on, we use our filter here. As you can see here, this is outer defense, inner defense, like this one. This is, is material blocked in the filters. You made the filter like this one, in that kind of the, I mean, water released from the turbine, and it can be released. And we reach it to one becquerel, which is normally thin becquerel is very, very acceptable for the water, if it come to be, because per kilogram per minute, and this is very strong pattern here about this one is removing cesium contaminated in turbine water. Just I'm introducing this one. How home filter integrated unit can work with in this one? I mean, inside the not only drain, but all the things it can be uptake by this kind, as you can see here from this kind of the a scheme. I mean, a cover picture of the journals like recovery of pesticide from the waters. So this is irrigated waters, I mean, contaminated waters with a lot of pesticide. It can be captured like this one, and you can take it like that one, and it can be released from the, I mean, the water. So whom capturing in the water can be chemical or pathogens, and you can see a lot of patent covering this area. One of the main things also is very difficult is like arsenic or any kind of heavy element like mercury or like lead or something. We, we work in this one. I am very proud that the National Geography in 20, uh, I mean 2012, is announced this kind of the technology as big discovery technology to save the, the world, I mean world drinking water from arsenic. And this is the technology itself, how we make it like this. And this is the filters, the home filters. And if you can start with, the, I mean, toxic arsenic like this, with the mineral, this is, is the underground water, I can say this is, is real analysis coming from elsewhere in the world wide. I can't say where, but this is the material itself, how we could order, and then you have, keep the mineral, healthy minerals, no no touch of this one, and you take only the, I mean, the bad thing is in the waters. So it is very, very important thing is, so it is selective removal, simple separation, of course. This is, um, it can be used many, many times. You can, I mean, control the waste. And it, it, I mean, the, the, the detector is mean the, 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 the material, it changes the color as you can see here, from here to here, for example. Then you can see here is, to, to, I mean, Tomo is Japanese word, is totally contaminated by the, I mean, by the, by, by the arsenic in, in, in that case. So manufacturing innovations, what I would like to, to move to another section is, how we could control the membrane? Because this is very, very important to come to, I mean, I mean, how you could make your technology, it's not material only, how you could make your technology 
to release to the public people or developing countries or to be in, in Japan, for example, in manufacturing of any kind of the water manufacturing, uh, I mean, water treatment plant. So our manufacturing is this, this is, I mean, these examples is about, take about two ton, two ton of the material itself. It can be layer by layer like this, based on the water contaminated source. But this membrane, it is not like RO or NF. It is another story exactly. It is, you could solve by this kind of the filters. And this is a material, this is a material is coming to be here, as I see, as you have seen here from, I mean, this one. So you, you solve the fluxing, the big problems in, in, in membrane. So this, by manufacturing of this membrane, home, I, I called it home membrane technology, so the clogging, the fouling, the filtration permission. So that it is, I mean, no rejection, for example. This is no rejection, not like RO. So the water can be filtrated totally, and the toxicant, it can be kept inside and the back the, and the very fixation and then by chemistry word is mean binding is so strong. It cannot be released until you take the materials outside of this and the treaty. You, you, you separate new material can be used again and then you can, I mean, control the waste management like arsenic or radioactives or any kind of pathogens away from the environment, not to release again to the soil or the water or so. So there's no rejection. This is 100%, I mean, flow rate. There's no need of pressure at all. I mean, it is only, I mean, the tap water, I mean, five pascal is enough, the water can flow. So we don't need, I mean, any kind of, the, I mean, power consumption. The lifetime reusability is very huge. I can say a years. So, I mean, you could use this material. If when it is full contaminated, you can be used the membrane again and again. This is kind of the manufacturing of the membrane itself, which is very, very strong. I mean, the fabrication and the trapping function of the home membranes. So th this is, is the backing, I mean, layer by layers, scavengers to, I mean, a trapping on this one. So we, we, we build this one based on what we would like to, I mean, decontaminate, to remove exactly. So if it is chlorine or fertilizer also, we have something like this. I mean, we, we make something analysis for the water sources and we are treated like this and we make them a fixture. So we have a family, a family of the membrane or a family of the home materials can be treated of any kind of the toxin or pathogens or radioactive substances. One of the most important things is, in, uh, I mean, as a scientist, how you could integrate your membrane or, I mean, material in membrane and in, in, in a water stations. Because this kind of this, I mean, station does not need a power, does not need much pressure, just only the, I mean, the feed, feed, I mean, feed water pumping from the, like this, from sea water or the oil waters. So you can use the solar energy. I mean, it's just only enough to, I mean, running the, any kind of the water treatment plants. Uh, so this is the future, actually, this is the future for us and to make very good technology so, and if the water has, I mean, desalination, so you could control the salt by the RO, but in that time, the RO is very, very high life, is very, very strong, I mean, very, very wide, long range, I mean, period of the home, I mean, RO you can use. And this is a statistical, I mean, practical test of the, our membranes. So how can it be treated with, I mean, the pathogens and the, uh, and the elements and the, as you can see for this one so the water quality this is very very important recipe. so this is a receipt i mean the company here they must do like this when they're going to i mean to, i mean export the our membrane filter to you this is the, the receipt that you can no chemical no radioactives of the water nothing in that one so removal of pathogens and the decontamination of toxic anions or elements is very very important in the water I, I, I do feel just what you can use for RO if it is integrated together is to control the saline only, the, the TDS. And I'm just giving you the examples. So our technology can save human from, I mean, any toxicant or hazards level of the materials, or elements or anything. Selectively remove the harms, leave this kind of the, I mean, wealthy minerals for the human body. Capturing and making the, I mean, warning, I mean, like signaling or sensors. 
And in the same time, you have zero discharge waste, which is very big issue in, in, in worldwide. I can't compare in my lecture on how the another, other technology can be. So just give me, I mean, one or two minutes for, I mean, uh, make the large scale, just to give you examples for this one. So we make the, I mean, this, I mean, the material and the membranes inside all of this home filters or desalination or bottling waters. Alhamdulillah, we have a great success with many Japanese companies. They are dealing in, in Middle East or even in Japan by this. And this is, is very good recognition. How the powers is, can you imagine two point kilo what meters if you're making for the I mean desalinations, you can treat it instead of six kilometers per one meter. The current technology, for example, uh, can you can you understand the saline coming after RO is so clean and you could make production of the pure salt and the water itself, you can treat it 90% of the water, not 25 or 30 percent from the feed water. This is very, very huge thing. So just the home home filter like this, the same mechanism, as I said, is capturing and the fixation inside this kind of the wheel order materials like this one. This is the filters. It can be shown like this. And this is just a statistic commercially. I, I can't say it. And this is a signaling. I mean, I just give brief examples so you can know exactly from the filters here. If you are traveling in the desert, you can just have tablet, you put in the water in the lake and you can understand what kind of toxicant exactly is the lake water safe to drink or not? As you can see here, this is for the traveling. If you're traveling anywhere, you don't know this one. And the filter is no need of the pressures, no need of the electricity, actually. And this is, is used for the, I mean, it's, it's WD, it's mean sea water desalination mobile station like this one. And this is, is the criteria and how the composition of the our membrane like very very important in Nihon 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 mean Japan Nihon in, in Nihon nanotechnology home and this is is very important sheet of the analysis this is the feed sea waters this is after you put uh, home after you put RO and this is our I mean the sheet of the water TDS is like this the I mean decontaminations I mean very very low levels nothing you can say is zero. And this is how can we use it in the Barakish water? And the, this is our home membrane unit. I mean, it's technology to make great innovation in the world by to save drinking waters, like what you can see here. And this is general myth. I mean, merits what I said in, in, in my talk. I'm repeated again, but because the time is coming huge. So this is technology. I mean, this technology will give high, I mean, product, I mean, high production of the water capacity, high quality with low cost and no waste and low power. So this is very, very important. You should have safe drinking water from radiations, safe society from any kind of disease. This is what I would like to finish with this diagram. It can be used for the cooking, showering, toilets, for drinking and domestic supply like this. Can be used in a mosque, in a house, in, every, in hospital. A lot of, I mean, facilities can be used. This is Japanese confidentiality of, in our society. This is the senators, I mean, from the government, what he said about our technology after Fukushima radiations. I mean, a huge, massive of media and the news and the press release coming to be like this. So they called home safe life is one of the great, I mean, theme I have it in our technology here in Japan. Finally, I acknowledge I, I, what I can say from this kind. It is good opportunity for me to deliver this kind of the work. Alhamdulillah, we've gotten success. And it is great recognizable from the, I mean, Prince Satam bin Abdelaziz, uh, International Prize for Waters. I would like to express my, my gratitude for His Majesty King Salman bin Abdelaziz Al Saud for being the patron of the award ceremony and also the conference itself. The founder of the prize, Rahimahullah, in His Royal Highness, the, Prince, the late Prince Satam bin Abdelaziz for his vision and inspirations, and also his real hands. Prince Khalid bin, bin Sattam for his continued support of the price to save the drinking water for the mankind. I'd like to, to thank the organizations of the committee of the, I mean, ninth international conference in the water resources and the environment for the inviting me for giving this lecture. I'd like to thank also my organization, National Institute of Material Science, particularly the president for his support. Also, I can't forget my research team. I mean, my research team 
and their support as hard workers and the friendship of them. And I would like to thank you all to listening to my lecture and any kind of the questions I'm ready. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته At the beginning of my presentation I would like to express my deep acknowledgement and sincere thanks to Dr. Abd al-Malik al-Sheikh and the top management of King Saud University's Prince Sultan Institute for Environmental Water and Desert Research for their kind invitation for me to deliver my keynote address at this important event. Uh, the title of my presentation is Advanced Governance Frameworks for Total Treatment and Reuse of Industrial Wastewater in Saudi Arabia, a case study. Before I proceed in delivering my presentation, I would like to clarify that this presentation deals with very, very important issue. We have been hearing during the past three decades or four decades. Most of these gym makers, water planners in Arab countries and also in other arid countries worldwide, requesting or targeting their use of waste, treated wastewater as a valuable source to fill the gap between the growing demands and the limited water supplies from conventional resources. And during the past three decades, many countries in the Arab region and also worldwide, in, specifically in arid zones where uh, the conventional water resources are limited, they put great efforts and they spend a lot of financial resources trying to reuse the treated wastewater, uh, domestic wastewater and industrial wastewater in addition to other non-conventional water resources. But many of these efforts have not met the planned targets according to the national, their national water strategies. And this presentation tries to give answers why those countries could not achieve their goals in their use of treated wastewater and why some few countries have managed to reach their planned targets in their use of a treated wastewater to fill the gap in water shortages for different uses. The contents of my presentation include the following. 
First, the importance of the reuse of treated wastewater in arid countries. Second, causes of failures in wastewater reuse schemes in some Arab and other arid countries. Third, adoption and implementation of governance frameworks utilizing integrated water resources management for total reuse of treated industrial wastewater in industrial cities in Saudi Arabia. Fourth, the gained benefits from the implementation of the adopted governance frameworks and total wastewater treatment and reuse. And fifth, I would, uh, I will, uh, you know, uh, explain the conclusions and recommendations at the end of my presentation. First of all, I would like to explain the importance of the reuse of treated wastewater in arid countries. I think in all Arab countries and almost most of arid countries worldwide, including Saudi Arabia, the gap between water demands and supplies has been widening, especially during the past three decades. And this has been due to in population and also rapid growth in urbanization. And this has resulted in immense increase in water demands for domestic, agricultural, and industrial utilization. The non-conventional -conven water resources in arid countries, as everyone knows, cannot or could not meet the growing demands. And so most of arid countries have been facing water shortages, water supply shortages. Consequently, the use of non-conventional water resources such as treated wastewater for industrial, non-potable and irrigation purposes has become a major water resource alternative to achieve sustainable water security in accordance to United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. And most of Arab countries, and also most of Arab countries, they have put or considered their use of a treated wastewater, whether it's domestic wastewater or industrial wastewater, as a major part water supply source in their national water strategies and action plans, including Saudi Arabia. Now I would like to, to talk about the causes of failures in wastewater reuse schemes in some Arab and some other arid countries. As I, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, in spite of hard efforts and large investment schemes by water agencies in many Arab and in many arid countries to maximize wastewater reuse to satisfy the growing water shortages, the achieved targets for the reuse remains limited and far below the expectation of national plans. And almost, you know, during the past maybe 30 years, in every and each conference, workshop, or symposium, or in regional meetings uh, on international level, regional level, national level, we hear many, many voices and concerns why we are not able to reuse the treated wastewater. And in many countries, the, the treated wastewater used to be treated and dumped in open wadis or in the sea. And, you know, and this is really not visible, not practical, and doesn't meet the national goals and strategies of arid regions to, to satisfy the growing demands utilizing each single drop of water. The treated wastewater is an important resource and we have to utilize sound schemes and tools to be able 
to utilize such valuable resource in order to achieve water security and to meet the sustainable development goals by 2030 in almost all arid countries, including Arab countries. This has been mainly the failure of not able, many countries have been not able to uh, utilize or reuse most of their treated wastewater, have been due to weak or absence of sound governance frameworks that are required for the implementation of the reuse schemes of treated wastewater, including deficiencies in policies, strategies, organizational structures, institutional and legal frameworks, and lack for enough financial and technical support. Now, I would like to give an example of few countries in Arab region and also in Arab regions, how they managed to successfully utilize most of the produced, treated industrial wastewater and domestic industrial wastewater. And my example is Saudi Arabia. And I would like to explain how Saudi Arabia has managed to successfully adopt sound governance frameworks for total treatment and reuse of industrial wastewater utilizing integrated water resources management tools in the kingdom. As, as many of us know, knows, during the past decade, Saudi Arabia has been among a few countries that succeeded in adoption and implementation of full-scale reuse of treated industrial wastewater in all industrial cities on national level with participation of private sector through public-private partnership schemes. And the magic for that success has been attributed to the adoption and implementation of sound governance frameworks utilizing integrated water resource management tools which have been customized to suit the local conditions of the kingdom. You, the, there are three pillars for the governance frameworks which hold in successful reuse of treated industrial wastewater in industrial cities in Saudi Arabia. The first pillar is creation of enabling environment to be able to reuse the treated industrial wastewater. Second pillar, creation of industrial wastewater use market. And third pillar is development of sound management instruments. Now I will clarify, you know, the elements of each pillar of the adopted governance frameworks. The first pillar, the creation of enabling environment, included development of national water strategy to achieve Saudi Arabia's 2030 vision and United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, emphasizing the reuse of treated wastewater, utilizing public-private partnership schemes. So this is the first major step. Second element is the, the, the government has secured strong political support for the developed national water strategy by higher economic council and a royal decree was issued in 2002 for, consider, for considering public-private partnership in six sectors and water sector was one of, among them. The third element has been development and adoption of sound legal frameworks and enforcement control over quality of collected wastewater treatment and distribution, identification of investment structure. So this is the enabling environment to achieve 
successful reuse of industrial wastewater. The second pillar is creation of industrial wastewater reuse market. To create a market, you need to do the following. You have to establish you know, a responsible organization for the wastewater reuse. And in Saudi Arabia, we managed to ask, uh, you know, the government has established our establishment of Saudi Authority for Industrial Cities and Technology Zones, Mudun, which has been responsible for total management of the industrial cities in the kingdom and the creation of industrial cities with required all required infrastructures under the supervision of Mudun. Second issue, development of sound wastewater collection, treatment, and reuse facilities among the uh, uh, available infrastructure in the industrial cities. And the third element was development of water regulator and enforcement agency. This is very important. Water regulator plays the role to judge, you know, the issues uh, or the rising issues between the stakeholder or the in, uh, the the uh, water wastewater reuse stakeholders, and in this case, the industrial plants and the wastewater treatment uh, operators and wastewater and uh, water reuse operators and uh, who are responsible for the treatment of waste for the collection of wastewater treatment of wastewater and distribution of wastewater uh, companies uh, in partnership with modern so the regulator role here is to to you know to be to regulate the relationship between the stakeholders and the water operators wastewater uh, treatment and reuse operators facilities and also is responsible to regulate the water tariff and to resolve any conflict between different stakeholders and the water uh, wastewater reuse treatment uh, operators. The other element has been the use of advanced and effective approaches in wastewater use, such as a closed water cycle. And in fact, Mudun has been very successful by adopting this approach. So there is, there is no single drop of water misused or not removed the water. Uh, fresh water coming to the factory or the industrial plants, then it is collected, the is collected, then treated, then it goes back in the loop to be treated and distributed again. So they close the loop and this is the most advanced approach in wastewater treatment and reuse. And it has been, you know, uh, running smoothly for more than 10 years in all industrial plants in the kingdom. The third pillar has been the development of sound management. Achieve successful wastewater reuse, we have to develop and adopt, you know, sound management instruments, which includes first development of bankable BOT projects for attracting skilled and qualified private sector participation through public-private partnership and for mobilization of additional financing. And everyone knows the private sector, he will not participate unless he, he is sure that whatever projects is going to be engaged to be, that projects should be bankable. Second thing, development and execution of transparent RFDs for wastewater treatment and reuse bidding processes, transparent bidding processes and contracting to gain 
private sector confidence. And this is extremely important. We have to have a transparent transparency in all processes, you know, f starting from the R issuing the RFBs, uh, qualification, bidding, contracting, until the end of the whole process to select, you know, the water, the private sector uh, company for water through BOT contracts. The, the third element of these management instruments is development of fair regulated water tariff, which reflects the cost and visible margin for profit. And normally this water tariff, this water tariffs uh, is reviewed by the regulator and it is being reviewed every, uh, every few years to make sure that the, 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 the whatever the industrial plants are paying is fair and reflects the actual cost to uh, achieve sustainable services for the wastewater collection, treatment, and reuse. And the last two elements, setting sound KPIs for effective monitoring of the implementation of BOT contracts, and this is extremely important, and there are set of KPIs which uh, have been reviewed, assessed, you know, for the, to meet to meet different targets in the operation and maintenance and reuse, to make sure that that all BOT contracts are meeting the objectives and the target of wastewater treatment and reuse. And the last element is adoption of sound customer services for ensuring good quality of the provided services for the industrial plants. And this is really extremely important tool to gain the confidence of the hundreds of industrial plants in industrial cities and to make sure they are satisfied about the provided services. Examples of the gain benefits from full treatment and reuse of industrial wastewater in industrial cities in Saudi Arabia, as I mentioned, you know, it, you know, adoption, development and adoption of sound governance frameworks, utilizing integrated water resource management tools, customized local conditions has resulted in full treatment of industrial wastewater in industrial cities. And I give you an example about the gain benefits you know, the total treatment and reuse of all used industrial wastewater of hundreds of industrial plants at first and second industrial cities of Dammam and Al Hassa have resulted in savings of about 28.72 million cubic meter per year of desalinated and transported seawater and also groundwater because if we don't use that reuse. Uh, wastewater, treated wastewater, groundwater will be pumped and ex the aquifers will be exhausted. Further, saving electricity consumption in the two industrial cities by about 855,000 megawatt hour per year, which is equivalent of saving 1.6 million barrels of oil per year, worth about $80 million at oil price of $50 a barrel. At the end, I would like to summarize the conclusions and recommendation and the recommendation for this successful uh, experience of Saudi Arabia. The successful experience of the kingdom in full treatment and reuse of all produced industrial wastewater in industrial cities is mainly attributed to a magic, magic, I can say, I call it magic, a procedure, which is the adoption and implementation of sound governance frameworks utilizing integrated water resources management tools. If you want to, to be successful in reusing the treated wastewater, you have to adopt sound governance frameworks 
other otherwise i think any government whatever they spend whatever they put effort they will not be able to be successful in it in reusing the treated wastewater and millions and millions of cubic meter of treated wastewater will be uh, spoiled and will be exhausted without reuse the above accomplishments have helped the kingdom in savings of large volumes of groundwater desalinated and transported seawater these have contributed to achieving sustainable water and energy security in accordance to saudi vision 2030 and to meet the united nation sustainable development goals by 2030 i believe strongly that the gained saudi experience is a good model for arab and many other arid countries for achieving water and energy security in accordance with the united nation sustainable development goals by 2030 i think you know the the, the steps are clear and here the 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 the, the path to be able to reuse, to treat and reuse the produced domestic and industrial wastewater will be by utilizing, by developing and adopting uh, sound governance frameworks, customized, you know, to, lo to suit the local conditions of each country utilizing integrated water resources water resources management tools by this i would like to thank you for your kind listening and i wish you all the best thank you again My name is uh, Polycarpus Palaras. I work at the Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology at the National Center for Scientific Research Democritus in Athens, Greece. And uh, the title of my presentation is Scale Up and Demonstration of Innovative Photocatalytic Nanofiltration Technology for Pollutants Removal and Water Recovery. In 2014, I was awarded the Alternative Water Resources Prize for the development of a novel water detoxification technology taking advantage of solar light and advanced titanium photocatalyst combined with ceramic and composite membranes. Today, I will present the current status of the technology, insisting on scale-up issues and the application to two demonstration projects, which are now under implementation in the frame of Horizon 2020 program of the European Union. The technology combines two processes, photocatalysis and nanofiltration. In photocatalysis, a semiconducting material absorbs light and the photogenerated carriers, holes in the valence band and electrons in conduction band, react with absorbed uh, water and oxygen and create reactive oxygen species. Many high oxygen radicals. These short lived species dispose high oxidizing ability and are able to decode to decompose a number, a great number of organic pollutants. On the other side, nanofiltration is a pressure driven membrane filtration where water, the water feed flows parallel to the axis of the membrane. The water passes through the micropore, microscopic pores of the ceramic monolith and thus Suspending solids, bacteria, and other organic matter are excluded from the permeate.
What is the concept of the na photo nanofiltration process? The concept of the photocatalytic nanofiltration combines synergistically in the same reactor two of the most promising advanced water treatment technologies, nanofiltration with ceramic membranes and photocatalysis with photocatalysts into the polymeric fibers and coating on the surface of the nanofiltration ceramic monoliths. There are many limitations when using photocatalysis and nanofiltration as standalone processes for micropollutants abatement. For example, in photocatalysis and slurry reactors, usually we can observe competition from the organic clotting, a variety of pollutants in the waste, toxic intermediates, and problems with uh, photocatalysis. Photo catalyst recovery. In the case of nanofiltration, sometimes the production of more toxic condensates, we have water loss and sometimes, and sometimes very frequently, we need to regenerate the membranes or to replace the membranes. On the contrary, all these problems are avoided and there are many benefits when using the PNRF technology. For instance, there is no generation of concentrated effluents, no fouling of the membranes, high, higher permeability of the membranes, and absence of retentate, and of course, less energy consumption. How does the modified membrane looks like? Here is an asymmetric gamma alumina ceramic me membrane. You can see here the nanofiltration layer of about one to two microns in thickness. And on the top, you have a very thin layer of the nanocomposite nanoparticulate titania photocatalyst. How does the lab reactor look like? The lab scale reactor was developed using photocatalytic monochannel ceramic nanofiltration monoliths, having an outer diameter of 10 millimeters, internal diameter of seven millimeters and the length of 150 uh, millimeters. The main features of the PNRF technology were developed under the Clean Water FP7 project, project funding by European Union. This technology was protected by European patent. The first demonstration project of the PNRF technology concerns the live pure agrowater project, now under implementation in the frame of European Union's Horizon 2020 program. The live project is expected to deliver a novel solution on the purification of agroindustrial effluents and the cost effective reclaim of the treated water. In the consortium, we have three pa uh, six partners, three from Greece and three from Spain. And the targets are fruit and vegetable industries in the agricultural cooperation of Zagora Pillion in Greece and Citricos del Antarax industry in Spain. With daily waste water from rinsing and washing procedures of 15 uh, and 460 cubic meters per day, respectively. What are the, ob the project ob objectives? 
the main name of the life pure water uh, uh, project is to develop and demonstrate a novel purification system for the sustainable management of the end of the pipe wastewater effluents generated in fruit industry. The prevention of losses of virus in organic and inorganic contaminants to the environment and the recycling use of the purified water. To achieve this, ob this objective, a close to market water purification system with the ability to effectively recycle 15 cubic meters per day of real agro waste water will be developed and commercialized. The project is both water and energy efficient, and it's expected to bring 60% reduction in the transmembrane pressure, significant extension of the process lifetime, and enhanced rejection performance and waste reduction. The system of 15 cubic sorry, meters per day will be developed at Zagori and will be benchmarked against conventional processes. In order to reinforce the transferability of the project, a pre-industrial scale demonstration unit of a capacity of to treat 1.2 cubic meters per day will be installed in Spain. The PNRFA technology will be adapted to the specific requirements of, of the Mediterranean fruit industry. And in line with the European water directives, the project will set an action plan for the integration of its outcomes to European and national environmental points. To achieve the project main objectives, a number of actions are now under implementation, including the benchmarking of common routines in waste handling in a fruit industry. Of course, the construction of the upscale system at Zagorin, the analysis of pesticides metabolites and heavy metals in water, and of course the evaluation of the uh, treatment system. The characterization of the water at the Zagori. Nine some in the water of the pipe waste waste water area. We determine the metals in water and sludge samples. Sites in water. We also perform toxicity assessment and microbiological analysis of water samples and treated waste water. In addition, the physicochemical characteristics of the feed water to the reactor were determined, suspending solids, organic load, natural organic matter, and pH. As you can see here, the concentration of heavy metals was determined in sludge samples, especially for sample points in the washing tank, at the exit from the washing tank, and in washing water collection tanks. Also, heavy metals were determined in water samples, and 
using ICPMS, 27 elements were measured. In addition, the concentration of pesticides was determined using LCMSMS, and thus, in water and sludge, and thus, residues of 51 pesticides were quantified after analysis of the water and sludge samples from the Zagori plant. In order to construct the reactor, we prepared for this purpose, we have applied and optimized the wet in a pilot scale spinner setup. And in this way, porous polymeric hollow fibers with embedded titanium. We have also proceeded to the procurement of the opt optical components. These are T8 25 watt UV lamps that irradiate the external surface of the membranes and also high power LEDs coupled with bundles of side glowing optical fibers irradiating the lumen surface of the multi channel monoliths. You have the spectral power and luminescence distribution of the corresponding light sources. We have also prepared the photocatalytic membranes. In fact, multi channel, large scale nanofilter with outer diameter of 25 millimeters, with seven channels having each one internal diameter of one. Uh, this monoliths were transformed to photocatalytic ones following a wash coating in a salt gel precursor solution, also containing titanium P25 nanoparticles. And the, the whole process was followed by drying and appropriate thermal treatment. The permeability, the modified membranes were characterized in terms of permeability and energy consumption. As you can see here, the permeability of the photocatalytic membranes, especially under UVA, uh, is higher than that of the untreated original infiltration substrates. And take into account the water recovery and the transmembrane pressure, more than 30% reduction in the energy consumption was achieved when using the photocatalytic nanofiltration membranes developed by the Wasquatic method. It is clear that permeability and rejection efficiency performances are stable. In the permeate side of the membrane and the retentate side of the membrane. Also, Conventional and nanofiltration experiments were performed with pesticides. Here is the pyrifos, the most abundant pesticides found in the samples. And also thiamethoxam. In this way, the effect of the physical chemical characteristics of the pesticide pollutants on membranes permeability and rejection efficiency was evaluated.
the pre-industrial scale reactor incorporated the multi-channel photocatalyst, the polymeric fibers, the optical fibers and the UAV lamps was constructed and is ready to be transferred to Citricos Della Tarax in Spain to confirm process transferability. Both flanges and wall of the reactor are made by inox steel and the unit has a capacity to treat 1.2 cubic meters per day of polluted water. The configurations of the PNFR technology for the two reactors was optimized. The unit for Spain uses 12 multi-channel membranes, six polymeric fibers with a length of 115.2 meters and 84 optical fibers, as well as seven UV lamps. For comparison, the reactor for Zagorin consists of 96 multi-channel membranes, 2,304 polymeric fibers with a total length of 2.3 kilometers, 672 optical fibers and 52 UVA labs. And has the reactor has the capacity to treat 15 cubic meters per day. The flow diagram of the pilot replicate for Spain with required equipment for the safe and unwanted operation of the process was defined by hazardous operating analysis. Besides the unit here, this also includes a pump with pressure transmitter and back pressure regulator, flow meters for concentrated filtrate systems, toxicity sensors, and digital controllers for the pump, turbidity, and conductivity measurements. The integrated process of the technology in the fruit and vegetable processing industry was designed and its technical performance was established. The conceptual process design of the technology was optimized, including the preparation of the flow diagram of the overall process, the wastewater treatment system, and the way to retrofit the washing process the, the, with the PNFR technology. Based on the targets for daily water production and purity, a high number of technical details and construction parameters were determined concerning the reactor components. Their functionality and interaction were optimized inside the industrial device. The key performance indicators of the process and the properties of the photocatalytic infiltration membranes were also determined with high accuracy. This, they comprise the system productivity, the pressure drop, the liquid velocity, the water permeability, the solute rejection efficiency, the surface charge, the kinetics of the pollutant photodegradation, the identification of the intermediate products, the identification of organic cations and anions, the pH, the temperature, and the irradiation intensity. In addition, a mathematical model was developed to simulate the entire industrial PNFR process. Also, the flow diagram of the live pure agrogotia process for Zagorin was established. And in this way, this permitted to determine the targeted inputs and outputs of the system, which comprise recycle reuse of wastewater in the industry by 90%. This means that for 1,346 cubic meters per year of water will be reused. Prevention of losses of contaminants to the environment by more than 90%, 6.8 uh, 
56 grams of pesticides per year. We have also a reduction of carbon footprint exceeding 41%, equivalent to 3.36 tons per year. And of course, it's very important socioeconomic impact with four full time equivalent job creation. iWaze is the second demonstration product, project of the PNFR technology. This is also an Horizon 2020 project entitled Innovative Water Recovery Solutions through Recycling of Heat Materials and Water Across Multiple Sectors. iWaze will develop a set of technologies to recover water and energy from exhaust gases in the dust industrial processes. It is expected to reduce fresh water consumption between 30 to 64% and to recover water and heat from humid gases by 30%. In the project, we have uh, 19 partners from nine European countries and will apply the PNRF, PNFR technology in three industrial sites, in Italy, in Spain, and Sweden, respectively. The iWaze project comprises three main technologies, exhaust condensation, water treatment, and waste valorization solutions. And the concept of iWaze is applicable to ceramics, chemical, and steel industrial sectors. As explained, the main objective of the waste project include the recovery of water and energy from exhaust gases and the treatment of steam condensate. In the frame of the iWaste project, the PNFR technology will be installed at 2 by 6 tubes in Oxidables. The company is a subsidiary of the 2 by 6 group, the world leader in the production of stainless steel tubes and nickel alloys. The implementation of our waste is expected to reduce the waste treatment cost, ensure water recovery, and reduce the energy cost with additional energy recovery. In this slide, we present the diagram of the steel production line at Tubasex, which comprises the following system. You have here the alkaline decreasing bath and the acidic decreased baths. You have the three gas ovens, the cooling tower, and first and the blast furnace. The company, in addition to water, uses thermal energy and electricity as energy sources. The operation of the steel pipe manufacturing process at Tubasex comprises several water streams. One of them concerns the alkaline decreasing bath here and the other the acidic decreasing bath with flow rates of 8 cubic meters and 10 cubic meters per day respectively. You have also another stream from the cooling system of hot parts of the three gas ovens, producing about 10 cubic meters per day of steam at 200 degrees, not recovered. And of course, water is directed to the cooling tower, and also water is used for gas washing in the blast furnace reactor. The iWaste technology, in iWaste, the PNRF technology will be used for removing trace metals and organics before use, especially in the alkaline decreasing bath and the acidic bath, 
as well as to recover water from the stage of the three gas ovens cooling of the hot parts. A first flow diagram of the airways industrial process was established, proposing the use of PNF reactor with capacity of treating 30 cubic meters per day, targeting water recovery higher than 60%, water savings higher, exceeding 450 liters per hour, heat recovery of 80% with minimum energy savings and reduction emission emissions of more than 30%, preventing CO2 emissions equivalent to more than 300 tons per year. For the reactor construction, we will use in high ways photocatalytic multi-channel ceramic membranes, visible light activated photocatalysts, side growing optical fibers coupled with waveguides and arrays of LEDs and Fresnel lenses. And of course, a high number of photocatalytic pores, polymeric fibers embedded with titania powder. What are the perspectives of technology? In addition to the end of pipe, wastewater effluence purification of fruit industry and steel and water recovery at the steel industry, the full scale prototype are able for automatic control and operation and can be further used for treating wastewater from the washing of the spraying machinery, phytosanitary equipment and containers of agricultural chemicals, grey water of hotels, public buildings and houses, effluent of biological treatment plants, drinking water for taste and, and odor abatement, and effluent of anaerobic fermentation in biogas production and recycle of water. Let me hear to acknowledge funding of all this work by Prince Sultan Prize, International Prize of Water, and European Union. And I want to thank also my collaborators in Greece and abroad for the precious help and assistance. Thank you very much for your kind attention. All right, good morning or good afternoon, uh, everyone who is watching. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, to present here. Um, and uh, I would first like to thank the organizers of the uh, uh, of the conference, uh, the PSIPW, um, and especially to uh, uh, David, the contact person who has always been helping me throughout everything. Uh, I would like to speak today about uh, resource recovery from water uh, with uh, membranes and then with a focus on, on lithium extraction. Why? Uh, because um, water is um, water recovery is very important, but we should keep in mind that uh, in um, especially in brines uh, we have uh, the whole table of Mendeleev is uh, more or less out there. And uh, today uh, it's not only water that counts, but it's also uh, all these other elements that uh, that play a role and there is uh, if we look into the details of the table of mendeleev there's uh, a lot of uh, interesting compounds and especially in our economy today if we extend water to uh, energy then uh, we might need uh, several of those um, uh, compounds and i've taken here lithium as an example of uh, one element that uh, is uh, very much in of interest and important to recover um, 20, uh, the 62 percent of the uh, lithium resources are present actually in in salt lakes. And uh, today, uh, as we see here on the on the image, we need a lot of lithium for um, uh, for batteries, uh, mostly for a lot of applications. Uh, we are trying to uh, uh, to uh, 
change our economy to uh, an electricity-based economy, but that would mean that we would need a lot of lithium. So we need technologies to extract this lithium, to obtain this uh, lithium from uh, sources. And then, of course, we should develop technologies to extract and to separate lithium from these uh, salt lakes. Um, if we look at the availability of uh, lithium, there is... Uh, uh, there are some prominent examples, and the, the most uh, important here is uh, the Sala de Atacama in the Atacama Desert in Chile, uh, where we find uh, a lot of um, the uh, lithium resources. Um, there are some, uh, some others, but there is now extraction on a large scale in, in Chile. Uh, so we should uh, look at uh, lithium and technologies in, in, uh, in, uh, in order to... Um, to cope with those extractions, uh, the extraction of lithium, uh, we may think that uh, an electrical car is a very environmental solution. Um, but if we take into account the extraction of lithium in Chile, it may not be so um, so environmentally uh, positive. So uh, technologies that would help us to have a more sustainable um, recovery of lithium from those brines would help us. Uh, this is an, uh, <clears throat> an extract from an, um, an uh, analysis in the news uh, where it uh, refers to, uh, to uh, filter lithium directly out of the brine using membranes, uh, avoiding the water intensive evaporation, which makes it unsustainable. So this is what we uh, tried to do. Now, this is not so easy to do. Uh, lithium, um, uh, selectively separating lithium uh, from a uh, solution, uh, should be based on uh, differences in, um, for example, in size with other compounds. Uh, and there is uh, uh, size deceiving uh, that could apply, uh, but then we, we need an, a very sharp um, distinction between the, uh, the sizes of the different compounds uh, to separate. That's an, um, not an easy task if we look at the ionic radius uh, without hydration or with hydration, uh, then we see that especially the separation between lithium and magnesium is important, uh, that this is uh, really a, a challenge. Uh, 0.76 and 0.72 ionic radius, a hydrated radius, uh, is, has a larger difference. So we could benefit of, uh, of that. Electrostatic repulsion is a second uh, mechanism that we could uh, apply. Chemical affinity <coughs> is a third one. So these are all... Um, ways of uh, trying to have a, a selective um, uh, separation of, uh, of lithium. Um, but it isn't uh, easy because if we look at other ions, so they might be just as, uh, uh, as large as lithium. Uh, they might not have a charge difference, etc. Something less explored is here, which I, I show, but I will not uh, discuss it uh, in, anymore, is the bio-inspired artificial ion pump strategy, something that we know from biological cell membranes and which has uh, uh, not yet been explored uh, too much. It is something that uh, is uh, uh, for further research is uh, something that we, we should look into. I'm showing here the, uh, the, the scheme of lithium prep, uh, separation from these uh, salt lakes just to uh, to indicate that uh, this is a very complex uh, procedure with uh, a lot of uh, different uh, steps that uh, have to be taken, uh, which um, shows that uh, th this is uh, not a one step. And then uh, if we have a uh, selective electrodialysis, it's just in fact part of this, this whole scheme. So membrane technologies for lithium separation are challenging because we have uh, in for magnesium lithium separation we have more magnesium in our solution than, than lithium that is uh, uh, one point and we we have to separate we have to uh, selectively uh, transport lithium through a, a membrane we can do that in in many ways that is uh, as uh, shown here i will focus on one the last one here the selective electrodialysis Uh, and proven to be a fact. 
of an, uh, a higher lithium recovery like this and a high assumption scale. We have a stack of uh, an electrode component for an, uh, another uh, application uh, where uh, copper and, uh, and zinc is uh, uh, separated. Uh, copper and zinc is going to the uh, going through this CEM, the cation exchange membrane, uh, and then further in the next uh, membrane we have the MVC, that is a monovalent selective membrane where the, the sodium is uh, transported, and then we have uh, a separation of copper and zinc from uh, from sodium. It, the same principle is what we have in mind for lithium separation, where of course the sodium is to be replaced by lithium. And we tried to do this uh, with uh, Kevlar aramid nanofiber membranes. Why? Because these Kevlar aramid uh, nanofibers are chemically very interesting. Um, if we look at the, the, the chemical structure, then we, we see that uh, there is uh, an, an, a stack of uh, um, compounds which uh, can be separated and can be fine-tuned to the desired properties. This is uh, showing how it works. We have these Kevlar aramid nanofibers, and then uh, we can split these. Uh, the uh, hydrogen bonds are, are split so that we have long uh, amide nanofibers. Uh, and uh, this can be then further cut with an amide hydrolysis reaction so that we have uh, short, uh, short length uh, uh, chains. And uh, this gives, uh, if then we, we turn that into a, a membrane, we use it as a basis for membrane, membrane synthesis, we have uh, a high physical uh, and chemical stability and a very much tunable structure which uh, could allow to exploit the these uh, selectivities that I showed before uh, to have this uh, size selectivity or, or uh, charge uh, selectivity or affinity uh, separation. Um, of course, we also need functional groups to, uh, to have this uh, selectivity and we uh, looked at uh, two specific uh, uh, compounds. Um, this, of course, opens the door to also explore other uh, chemical compounds that are similar that may or that may have a similar function. The first one is a polyforce styrene sulfonic acid comalic acid sodium salt, which you see here on the left. Um, this reacts with the NH2 groups on the Kevlar aramid nanofibers and forms then interpenetrating networks. So we have then a cation exchange uh, sites uh, where we can combine the, the effect of uh, size separation and charge uh, separation. Uh, it gives us strongly and weakly acidic uh, groups on the uh, structure of the membrane. Then, is, uh, then we also combine with another compound for amino-2266 tetrametylpipiridine one oxyl ATTO, uh, which then reacts with the COOH groups um, and forms then an, a, a positive surface layer uh, where we hope that uh, this would be the compounds that where we can increase the selectivity. Uh, and also, because of this uh, positive uh, surface layer, uh, to uh, combine this with anti-scaling properties. Uh, because, of course, we should keep in mind that so we are looking at water with uh, a lot of ions, uh, so a lot of scaling potential. Uh, and most of the scaling uh, potential comes from positively charged uh, ions. Thinking of uh, calcium, for example, as a the, the first culprit for scaling. So uh, we, with this positive surface layer, we, we may be able uh, to decrease that effect of uh, fouling, which we see here, um, where the um, different compounds are present, uh, the functional groups on the membrane, and play their role in... Um, uh, excluding the, uh, the magnesium and, and calcium, uh, so that we have both the the, uh, the rejection of of magnesium for the separation and the um, repulsion of calcium to have the anti-scaling effect. And we did then a lot of experiments with these uh, um, uh, two compounds. Uh, we made a lot of different membranes. Um, with different uh, formulations with and without uh, ATTO uh, and with um, a range of um, concentrations of uh, PSSMA. This is showing um, what, we, uh, what we did. 
uh, with the ATTO, we use that as an uh, uh, either present or not present condition. And then the, the ratio of the um, PSSMA and Kevlar aramid nanofibers was then varied uh, from uh, zero to four. And then we did a lot of uh, characterization methods. I will show you uh, some of that. Uh, first of all, the uh, the microscopic structure that was for us the starting point to see how successful was our um, our, our modification. Uh, the Kevlar aramid nanofibers uh, bear uh, are shown on top, and then we we added uh, the um, uh, ATTO and the Kevlar uh, and the the, the PSS uh, MA in the structures below where we see that uh, we indeed see that something is changing on the surface. Uh, there is uh, some surface roughness uh, appearing, which uh, shows that these functional groups are indeed uh, present uh, and that they, they, they would be uh, uh, present. The elemental mapping also uh, confirmed this. Um, the in water content it was uh, very important in our, in our analysis. Uh, because this uh, would uh, determine much of the uh, functionality of the of the membrane and we saw that uh, very interestingly that we could shift it in the two directions so by uh, playing with the two compounds with the PSSMA functionalization and with the ATTO uh, function functionalization starting from a contact angle of uh, 76.6 degrees uh, we could either go up uh, and go down, and the same is for the for the the, the roughness. Uh, we, we can look at the two uh, in this in the um, at the same time. Uh, the ATTO was found to decrease the roughness and the hydrophilicity, whereas the PSSMA increases the roughness and the hydrophilicity. So that was very uh, uh, very interesting because that allows us to really tune uh, these uh, uh, two two properties uh, and. That would determine then the um, transport properties of the of the membrane, and as we hoped, also the separation. Because of course, uh, the separation is what we uh, is is the bottom line of what we want to achieve. Uh, however, it was uh, in the first place the, um, the ion exchange capacity and the water content which uh, changed. And we saw here that uh, in the figure on the on the right, figure six. We see a uh, dramatic effect on the uh, on these both um, parameters, the ion exchange capacity and the, and the water content would uh, drastically increase with our formulation uh, when uh, when we change the functional groups. Um, we then also looked at the uh, um, electrical properties of the of the membrane. Important uh, for the transport. Uh, this was. Uh, in the first place, uh, not uh, for selective transport, but uh, in order to have a fast transport of uh, yeah, common ions so we did this with, with uh, common sodium chloride uh, solutions. We see on the on the on the left side we have uh, our um, newly developed membranes, and we compare this with this uh, CMX CSO uh, CIMS membranes, and we see that the Electrical the surface electrical resistance uh, is uh, much much lower uh, is an, an, um, yeah uh, drastically lower than these commercial membranes, which is important because that would give us an, an um, uh, higher current density and therefore a faster transport of uh, common ions through the membrane. And this is what we also saw in these uh, current voltage curves on the on the right side where we uh, compare the uh, KNF2 uh, membrane with these uh, CMX, CSO, and CIMS uh, membranes. We did some, and we, I'm going to be brief in, for the sake of time in, on this, uh, we did some performance uh, measurements in <coughs> uh, these uh, common salts with uh, sodium chloride, where we saw uh, that the desalination efficiency was equal to the, the CMX membrane, the commercial membrane, Concentration efficiency was uh, lower because we have an, uh, a very, very thin membrane uh, with only eight uh, uh, micrometer membrane uh, thickness. So we go very fast. Uh, but um, then in, in terms of concentration, we, of course, also have other ions that are transported. We then further looked at um, the, the selectivity, lithium-magnesium selectivity, which is the big challenge, the big question. 
uh, where we uh, at first sight we uh, we had an, uh, a similar um, selectivity compared to uh, to commercial membranes. Uh, the commercial membranes were doing about just as well, which gave us an, uh, 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 some confidence that by further tuning the uh, um, the functionalization of the of the membrane, we could come to an, uh, a better lithium magnesium separation. Keeping in mind that this is a very difficult uh, separation to do, uh, we did the also uh, some scaling uh, measurements um, where. Uh, we uh, measured what happened on the membrane directly uh, and uh, we, we did some uh, experiments with uh, uh, the ions that we thought would be the culprits for scaling uh, in, um, in this uh, setup and with uh, different uh, membranes. Uh, and this was the second point that was highly successful with, uh, with our membranes. The anti-scaling properties were very clear. Uh, if as a function of time we, we followed the uh, surface uh, electrical resistance, uh, then um, we, we see that the, uh, the blue line uh, was uh, showing almost no changes in, in uh, electrical resistance, whereas the commercial, the three commercial membranes, all three uh, were um, obviously uh, increased in resistance. We saw that also visually on the membrane uh, that uh, these uh, were uh, the commercial membranes were affected, whereas the Kevlar aramid nanofibers were not affected. So I would like to come to conclusions on, on this part. Uh, the, the membranes uh, with the uh, Kevlar aramid nanofibers with functionalizations uh, with, were uh, found to have good physical properties, so good basis. ATTO was uh, very good for uh, for the anti-scaling uh, effects. Um, that was the, the strong point, and also the uh, the, um, the transport, the fast transport with the low electrical uh, resistance was an, uh, was a very good point with these membranes. Selectivity should be further improved, and this was something where we uh, could have the same performance as commercial membranes, but we 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 could do better. And of course, we have a margin because. Uh, the membrane thickness uh, has a lot of uh, margin to be increased. Uh, and then also the functionalizations, uh, which uh, clearly work and clearly have their, their effects, uh, but could be further uh, fine-tuned because we have here a tunable structure that is giving uh, endless possibilities. I want to show some alternatives uh, that uh, could be uh, could be explored and where we, we also um, had some, some good uh, results on, on lithium separation. Apart from these Kevlar aramid nanofibers, and that's one way, uh, we also uh, tried the, a surface coating with a thin layer. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is showing um, one approach uh, based on, uh, on L-DOPA, uh, where we can um, even go beyond what we had with the Kevlar aramid nanofibers, because we can add here the functionality of the selectivity to uh, to the membrane. Uh, this can be done by, for example, a layer by layer assembly. This is what I uh, I want to suggest here with the layer by layer assembly. You can actually um, work on this uh, uh, benefit from the margin of uh, thickness that we that we had with uh, the Kevlar aramid nanofibers, and um, go as far as you want to go in terms of selectivity. Self-assembly of graphene nanosheets is another one, very promising. We had the, the best selectivities, uh, lithium and magnesium, uh, by benefiting from this uh, graphene lattice. I think we, uh, yeah, we can uh, finely tune the um, um, interlayer spacing of, mul of multi-layer graphene so that you can actually uh, have an, a very sharp separation from these ions uh, that uh, I showed before, and um, benefiting from these uh, small size differences uh, because we have this well-defined uh, interlayer spacing with the multi-layer graphene. Um, so this was where we also had some good uh, results. This is showing some of our uh, devices. And I would like to end with a uh, thank you to the people who are, uh, have been working on that, especially Yan Zhao is uh, the guy in the right uh, picture on the left, uh, who has uh, worked a lot on this is now my postdoc, and this is uh, the rest of uh, of my group. Some of the of of them 
worked on this and uh, are now professors uh, often in China. And this would end my presentation and uh, I should be here for further questions. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me to this ninth international conference on water resources and edit environments. Today we will talk about water diplomacy, a principled approach to resolve complex water problems. I'm Shafiq Islam from Tufts University. This reminds me really the eighth international conference we were in Saudi Arabia. So this is a difficult time and I am recording it here from Boston. Hopefully we will have some interactive conversation when we have the regular meeting. So today I will make my presentation in about next uh, 20 minutes or so. So whenever we go to any news sources these days, we see this particular idea of water crisis. Sir. So there is a water crisis going on all over the globe. And if you really want to dig in a little bit deeper, what you see really is not exactly clear what we mean by water crisis. So to give you some scientific facts and also some societal facts, uh, we have heard that more people die from unsafe water than from all forms of violence, including war. So this is a very startling statistic that we know for quite some time now. But we have also known that every dollar that we invest in safe water and sanitation yields somewhere between $5 to $27 in economic and health benefits. So that means this is not an economic question. We invest $1, we can get back $5 to $27. So still, we do not have about 760 million people does not have access to water. Over 2 billion people does not have water and we're calling them water scarce region. So what is going on then? What is going on really in terms of water access, what UN, UNDP, WHO, what they're telling us that if we have 20 liter per person per day, then we have access to water. Yet about 760 million people across the globe does not have access to water. Then what does water scarcity means? For example, Saudi Arabia is a water scarce country. What does it mean? It means that it has fewer than 1000 cubic meter of water per person per year. That translates to 2740 liter per person per day. So look at the difference between 20 and 2740. To ac get access to water, we need only 20. To make it water scarce, I need 2,740. So there is a vast difference really what we mean by water crisis. Now, if we want to provide water to everyone on the globe, 7 billion of us, 50 liter per person per day, it will cost us about $120 billion a year. It's a lot of money, but if you compare that to global GDP, which is $85 trillion, so this is only 0.14% of global GDP. So not much money. Still, every eight second, one child dies because of lack of water or sanitation. So what is going on then? It is not about economic scarcity or that we do not have resources. We just need $120 billion. And globally, we are spending $85 trillion. So what is the key question? What is this water crisis that we talk about? So there is nothing basically you can find in terms of water crisis. Water crisis in Saudi Arabia is quite different than water crisis during flood in Bangladesh or during hurricane in the US. So it has different phases, but if you look at really this whole idea of a crisis, crisis is something that we need to address. So what I have done really, I've looked at really since there is no good measure of water crisis, I looked at how many papers were published with this word called water crisis across the globe from 1950 to 2020. What you notice here really in 1950, it was, was not there. In our news media, in our publications, we did not use water crisis. But in 2020 right now, we are talking about at least 6,000 times. 
Now, if you want to relate that to say global GDP versus water crisis or global population versus water crisis, you see a very significant linear trend. That means over last 70 years, just sheer increase in global GDP, just sheer increase in global population can be fully explained why we have crisis. Uh, this is not going to go away then. Then we need to find out some pragmatic way to address this problem because there are more people right now than there were people any time in human history. World has changed. In 20th century, scientists discovered, engineers created, and society benefited, and everything was very good. But in 21st century right now, water, uh, world is globalized. The food that being basically consumed in Saudi Arabia may be being produced in the US. The cloth that I am wearing in the US may be coming from China. This is also bringing in a lot of water and that is called virtual water. So that means water is connected in many, many things that we use. Then science, engineering, policy, politics, these are all interconnected now. Whatever happens sometimes right now in Boston, in basically in less than a minute, it can be all over the globe through the internet, Facebook, Twitter, and everything else. So what is happening then, we have competing demands for limited amount of water. When you have competition for a resource which is limited, then you get into conflict. In 20th century, we had technical objectives. We want to increase efficiency. We want to minimize pollution. We want to optimize cost. Those were very good because these are engineering problems can be easily done. What is going on here, though, is as we go more and more into 21st century, we have other objectives. Now we want to ensure sustainability. We want to promote equity. We want to enhance social justice. As a result, these technical objectives and these uh, societal objectives are in conflicts. When they are in conflicts, then we get into some type of basically discussion. Why do we resolve this conflict? So in that sense, there are people who say, yeah, so either you're an optimist or you're a pessimist. We say, no, no, I think you are probably both as a water diplomat, you want to be a principal pragmatist. So what does that mean? What it, that means really, the glass is not half full, it's not half empty. We need the right size of glass. If the glass size is right, then I have always full. So that means we have, create, we have to create opportunities where we can use the resources that, that we have for our optimal use. So how do I learn really to create actionable knowledge when things are complex? So this is the wisdom I said, we have a lot of information about water, but information does not translate to knowledge and then knowledge does not try, transform to wisdom. So what does that mean? So let's say that the information that we have, there are lots of rabbits and there are a lot of grass, a lot of soil, rainfall is happening. Now, knowledge is rabbit eats grass <coughs> and grass grows in soil and rain falls from clouds and wolves eat rabbits. Now, if this continues and if I am wise, then if I kill all the rabbits or all the wolves, then the rabbits will eat up the grass and the soil will wash away and then I will have no grass. So this is what we need really. We have to see really how things are interconnected with each other, which one can I intervene and which one I cannot. So essentially then I have to take data, get information, get knowledge, get wisdom, and then find out something that I can do. So what can I do? Why, what, why is it so difficult? The difficulty comes from really, we have water quality, water quantity, and ecosystem. We need water for all of these three. Then on the other side, we have assets, could be economic assets, could be human assets. Then we have values, then we have governance. How do I govern limited amount of water? So these are societal problem and natural problem, and this is happening in a political world. If it does really, then what happens really when there are differences in political boundaries, knowledge, know-how, management, and capacity, then this leads to some very complicated interactions. As a result, really, what we have, really, we have many, many variables. Those are working, many, many processes, actors, and institutions. And then we have values and interests and tools. The so values, for example, the Ganges probably is one of the most polluted river in the world. But for the people in India, it is holy water. So that holy water could be polluted in my, basically, scientific assessment. But from the value perspective, from cultural perspective, this could be very 
wholly. So in that sense, I just cannot take it and say that this is polluted, we cannot use it. We need to understand what those values are. Then we have problems and policies and politics and how I combine all these three together to find something that is effective. So this multiplicity of choices, then what it will lead to that I cannot have really an optimal solution. I need to work with the situation that I am in and the context that I am in. So that brings us to our this framework that we are calling. So who defines the context? Who decides water crisis for whom and at what scale? Then you find out who are the appropriate stakeholders. Can I find out who is being affected? If I want to address the problem of water scarcity in Saudi Arabia with their work on agriculture, with uh, other commodities, how do I really ensure that who are the appropriate stakeholders, they can come in and define what the problem is. Once you have done that, then you have to find out what are the constraints. Do I really have physically limited amount of water or do I have lack in technology? Do I have resources? Once I have that, that these are the constraints that I have, then I can start addressing what are the solutions those will work for that particular context. Once we have designed a solution, then we go and intervene and make the solutions applicable and then monitor this see really how it is progressing and adjust as we go along. So this can be done really with any water crisis, whether it's in Saudi Arabia or in Brazil or in Bangladesh or in Boston does not matter. You have to go to a particular place and find out the what is the nature of the water crisis that we are trying to solve. So that tells us to basically these problems, proposals, and politics, then gives, gets to policy. And unless all three are aligned properly, so you, you have a good problem definition, you have a proposal, you have a policy, then all three converges, then you have a policy window, then th things can be done. So what we need to do is really these three streams have their own dynamics. What is the problem? What is the proposal that I'm doing? What is the politics of the situation? Can I basically see how to align all these three? If I have one, two, it's not going to work. I have to figure out really how to combine all three so that I can have some effective solution. So that means this plurality of choices that we get from interactions of variables that defines the water crisis brings us to this idea of pragmatism, meaning that I need to be pragmatic given the problem definition that I have given the politics that I have. Once I have a pragmatic solution to this problem, it cannot be just pragmatic. I cannot just decide that, look, I just want to maximize economic benefit. What happens to sustainability then? So then I have to have some principles too. So I need to decide really what those principles are. And these principles will be defined by the people who are affected by that particular problem. So you want to be pragmatic, but you want to be pragmatic with some principles. Once you have that, then you need to find out really what is the capacity and what is the constant. The solution that will work for the US may not work really in India or in Ethiopia. We need to find out what solutions works in the US, what will work in Ethiopia. That will depend really what is the Ethiopian capacity, what the Ethiopian constants are. Once you have that, then you can develop some sustainable solution by actually doing this. We need to do things and learn and keep doing it as we go along. So we have written these things in really several books over the last few years. We have four books that I would like to basically highlight here. So if you want to get more about this, this would be a good place to start. And all these four are related to some of the actual problem of water diplomacy and water crisis that has been solved by using this idea that we are calling a principal pragmatic framework. What that means really, this is a framework, this is like a lens. This lens is striving to be a framework for equitable and sustainable management of water by using complexity science as the theoretical lens and negotiation theory as a process to address all contextual in emergent contingencies that we have to address the water crisis of our time. Thank you. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today to give uh, my lecture. 
Uh, my name is uh, Mohamed Kayez. I am professor at the Faculty of Physical Science of the University Complutense of Madrid. And also I am associate researcher in Madrid Institute for Advanced Studies of Water and chair of the research group Membranes and uh, Renewable Energy. Today, my lecture, I divide it into three parts. First of all, just I would like to give general and brief description of membrane distillation technology. Then the characteristics required for a membrane to be used in membrane distillation. And finally, I will share with you some case studies on surface modified membranes for MD, a flat sheet, hollow fiber, micro and nanofibrous membranes. Uh, membrane distillation is non-isothermal separation process used generally for desalination. The membranes to be used in membrane distillation must be porous and hydrophobic. And the driving force here is the temperature difference, which in this is the vapor pressure difference between both sides of the membrane. Because of the hydrophobic character of the membrane, there is formation of liquid vapor interfaces at both sides of the membrane pores. So in this case, the temperature, for example, here is higher than the other side of the membrane. The vapor pressure here is higher than the other side. So there is a, a water molecules that evaporates from this hot liquid interface, uh, uh, liquid vapor interface, cross the pouring vapor phase, and then condense on the other side of the membrane. We have here four main MD configurations in order to establish this driving force direct contact membrane distillation, sweeping gas membrane distillation, air gap membrane distillation, and vacuum membrane distillation. MD has various advantages, and just only I would like to mention here some of them. Uh, the first one is the high separation factor achieved, which is higher than 99.9% .9 whenever you use non-volatile solutes in the phase solution you can produce not only distilled water, but also ultra pure water. Also MD can be used for the treatment of high salinity solutions up to saturation. In this case, you can, um, for example, treat uh, reverse osmosis prior and look to zero liquid discharge, for example. If you have a look to this figure, you can see the tremendous increase of the number of pub papers published each year up to December of last year we have published 2,455 uh, papers. Like any other membrane separation process, MD has also some drawbacks, just as the membrane pore weighting, the internal heat loss, which is associated to heat transfer by conduction through the membrane matrix, the vapor pressure polarization, which is associated to the temperature and concentration polarization effect, and also the uncertain long-term operation associated to membrane pore wetting, especially in those semi-pilot semi plants that use commercial membranes prepared for other purposes rather than for MD. The big problem here is the no availability of membranes designed specifically for membrane insulation. This is why various research groups start to work on MD membrane engineering during the last uh, decade. If we have a look to this figure, we can see the increase in number of published paper each year up to the summer of last year on fabrication and modification of membranes for MD. Up to the summer of last year, we have published 703 papers, which is 28.6% of the total number of published papers on MD membrane preparation. What are the characteristics required for membrane to be used in membrane distillation? Other than the porous structure, the good thermal stability, excellent chemical resistance, the high permeability, two other main characteristics are important here for an MD membrane. The first one is the high liquid interpressure of water that must be achieved using membranes with high hydrophobic character and small maximum pore size. And the second one is the low thermal conductivity, which can be achieved using membrane with high porosity or high volume fraction. During the last 15 years, we um, worked on 
MD membrane engineering. And here I just, I would like to share with you some cases on composite porous membranes, hydrophobic hydrophilic double layered in flat sheet and hollow fiber forms, and also nanofibrous membranes. Flat sheet and hollow fiber membranes. The idea here is to, to design porous composite hydrophobic hydrophilic membranes for the configurations, direct contact membrane distillation and liquid gap membrane distillation. In this case, the liquid permeate is brought into contact with the hydrophilic layer of the membrane, which has bigger pores. So the liquid penetrates inside the big pores of this hydrophilic layer. So we can reduce here the distance between liquid vapor interfaces. Um, whenever you, you reduce this distance between the liquid vapor interfaces, you expect to increase the permeate flux. And also at the same time, you can reduce the heat transfer by conduction if you design well this hydrophilic layer. How we prepare these membranes? We prepare them in, in simple step by phase inversion technique. First of all, we dissolve the polymer solution. We use a host hydrophilic polymer. We dissolve it in solvent. We add an additive in, for pore formation, and we add also fluorinate, fluorinated polyurethane additive. We cast the membrane. We expose it to solvent evaporation. During solvent evaporation, this FPA migrate to the surface of the polymer air interface changing its characteristics because of its lower surface free energy compared to that of the host hydrophilic polymer. Then we coagulate the membrane, we immerse it in ethanol water solution and in order to preserve the formation of the pores and finally we we'll dry it in air at ambient temperature. Uh, this FPA are synthesized in two steps polymerization. First of all, we mix the isocyanate with polyor to get an urethane prepolymer. This urethane prepolymer is end capped with fluoro alcohol to get the fluorinated polyurethane additive, which consists of mean polyurethane chain terminated with two fluorine segments. We prepare different types of PAs and we are interested in those PAs that exhibit high fluorine content and low molecular weight in order to favor the migration of this FPI towards the polymer air interface. We developed various research study on FPI modified flat sheet membranes. And here just I would like to share with you a case study on the effect of the host polymer concentration. In this case, we used as host hydrophilic polymer polyethylamide. The concentration of PI was maintained at two weight percent. The concentration of the host hydrophilic polymer was varied from 10 to 20 weight percent. And you can observe that the water contact angle of the modified membranes is higher than that of the unmodified membranes. This is a cross section of the modified membrane. And these are the FM images of the top surface and bottom surface of these modified membranes. We confirm the migration of this FPI by SEMADX analysis. We focus more on the concentration of fluorine because fluorine as, is associated to FPI. And uh, we observe that the concentration of fluorine is higher at the top surface compared to that when we go down inside the membrane. It, uh, we use also X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy analysis carried out at different takeoff angles in order to study or the migration of the CFPI to the polymer air interface. And we observed also that the concentration of fluorine near the top surface is higher than that far from the surface. So this confirms also the migration of PI to the polymer air interface. We characterize these membranes by different techniques, for example, liquid interpressure of water, pore size, effective porosity that takes into consideration the tortosity of the membrane pores, we well, observe that the liquid interpressure of water uh, of the modified membranes is higher than three bar, but the pore size is below 25 nanometers. And this is an order of magnitude smaller than the pore size of the commercial membrane. So, uh, but surprisingly, when we use these membranes in direct contact membrane distillation or desalination, 
We observe that the permeate flux of these modified membranes is higher than that of the commercial membranes prepared for other purposes, as, say, as said before, for microfiltration purposes. And um, the reasons behind this is, as I said before, you, we could reduce the distance between the liquid vapor interfaces formed on both sides of the thin hydrophobic layer. The other reason here is the mechanism of mass transfer. For the modified membranes, the pore size is very low, below the main free path of the evaporated molecules, so not some type of flow is applied. However, for the commercial membranes, the combined natsen and bromine molecular diffusion is the mechanism of transport for these membranes. Finally, we use these membranes for long-term operation, more than three months in desalination using saline solutions up to 200 grams per liter. The modified membranes, they work very well with very high salt restriction factors. However, the um, commercial membranes, they got wet just only after some days of operation. Therefore, we propose the modified membranes for the treatment of brine or petrol industrial wastewater. Let's move now to the modified hollow fiber membranes. The situation here is very challenging because the, um, this FPI can make us towards the inner surface, the outer surface, or both the inner and outer surface. Um, dry wood spinning technique is normally the method used to prepare the hollow fibers. As you can see here, we have a lot of parameters associated at the same time. So if you want to study migration of FPI towards the inner surface or outer surface, it's very challenging. More than that for flat sheet membranes. We, developed, we, we carried out the various research study on FPI modified hollow fiber membranes. And just only I would like to share with you a case study here on the effect of the host polymer concentration. We as Host hydrophilic polymer, we used polyethylamide. The, its concentration was varied from 14 to 17 white percent. It was maintained constant at 2 white percent. It is important here to um, measure uh, the surface tension, the viscosity of the polymer solution because they affected the diameters of the uh, prepared hollow fibers. All other spinning parameters were maintained the same, and we observed reduction of the outer diameter of the hollow fiber upon the addition of FPI in the polymer solution and also with the increase of the concentration of the host hydrophilic polymer. This affects also the thickness. These are some SEM images of the cross-section of the hollow fibers. And um, in terms of FPI migrations, we measured first the water contact angles of the outer and inner surface of the hollow fibers, and we observed an increase in water contact angle for the modified hollow fibers. You can observe here that the outer layer is more hydrophobic than the inner layer. We um, Confirmed this result by SEMADX analysis. We focused more on the concentration of fluorine. As I said before, uh, fluorine is associated to FPI, not to the host hydrophilic polymer. And we observed higher concentration of fluorine at the outer surface than at the inner, sur at the inner surface, whereas the concentration of fluorine in the center were the lowest. This indicates that effectively there is migration of FPA from the center to the outer surface, whereas that of the inner surface was maintained constant. This is attributed mainly to the fact that it is more likely that uh, coagulation of the hollow fiber starts from the inner surface. So there is no much time for FPA to migrate to the inner surface. Finally, we confirmed also this result by XPS analysis. And we observe that the concentration of fluorine is higher at the outer surface than at the inner surface. So the outer surface is more hydrophobic than the inner layer. We characterize these membranes by liquid interpressure of water, and we observe higher liquid interpressure of water values for um, the modified hollow fibers, as you can see here, higher than three bar. The pore size, effective porosity, and porosity were reduced with the addition of PI. 
And the mechanical properties were also improved. Young modulus, tensile strength, and elongation at bricks. Whenever we added FPI to the polymer solution, similar to what occurred for flash sheet membranes. Finally, we use these membranes in desalination by direct contact membrane distillation, and we observed higher permeate flux for the halo fibers prepared with the lowest concentration of the host hydrophilic polymer. So we selected the final fiber for further experiments and stable permeate flux with quite stable electrical conductivity of the permeate below six microsiemens per centimeter. So these membranes are very robust with high liquid interpressure of water for desalination by DCMB. Let's move now to nanofibrous membranes. In 2008, we uh, proposed for the first time the use of nanofibrous membranes for MD technology, high permeability, low thermal conductivity, high porosity, avoid volume fraction, other than other um, suitable uh, parameters for an MD membrane. And these membranes are prepared normally by electrospinning technique. If we have looked to this figure showing the increase in number of papers published each year since 2008. Um, uh, up to December of last year, we have published 145 papers on electrospan nanofibrous membranes for MD, which is about 20.6% of the total number of published papers on membrane fabrication and modification. Electrospinning is uh, not an easy uh, technique to prepare nanofibrous membranes because we have to apply a high electric voltage up to 30 kilovolts. We have to establish an electric field between the metallic needle. So we have here a lot of instabilities. And if we want to uh, study migration of PI towards the surface of nanofiber, it is not very easy. It is more challenging because we have a lot of forces. I just would like to share with you a case study here on concentration. As host hydrophilic, host hydrophilic polymer, we use polysulfone. And the concentration of PI was varied from 0 to 6 white percent. All the electric spinning parameters were important here to, for electrospin. Now, the electrical conductivity These are some SEM and TEM images. Membranes, you can see that there are bit free nano networks. And with the increase of the concentration of FPI, the nanofibers acquired more curved nanofiber structure, as you can see here with larger size, wider size distribution, rougher and even corrugated. The corrugations are aligned in the direction of the nanofibers. Below here, you can see the TM images of the polysulfone nanofiber, which is uniform and homogeneous, and those of the uh, modified nanofibers, which uh, show uh, more heterogeneous structure. We characterize this membrane by X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy analysis carried out at different takeoff angles, as you can see here. And uh, we observe that the concentration of fluorine um, in the nanofibers increases with the increase of the concentration of FPI. And this is normal. The, the important result here is the reduction of the concentration of fluorine with the increase of the angle attack. And this confirms the migration of PI towards the surface of the nanofiber or microfiber. This result was also confer uh, confirmed by the measurement of water contact angles. And we observed an increase in water contact angle with the increase of the concentration of PI, even we could prepare super hydrophobic nanofibers. Uh, the mechanical properties were also improved as we observed for flat sheet and hollow fibers. The thickness also, you can see here that it is increasing with the increase of the concentration of PI, and this is attributed to the increase of the nanofiber diameter. 
it was not expected the increase of the void volume fraction with the uh, concentration of PEI because the conductivity was uh, increased. And this result associated mainly to the increased thickness and the nanofiber diameter. We uh, also measured the interfiber space, minimum, maximum, and mean. Uh, these are the results. And um, let's move. No, I want the previous slides. Just one second, please. This one. Yes. And we can see here the liquid interpressure of water, the increase of the liquid interpressure of water with the increase of the con uh, concentration of the reduction of the liquid interpressure of water with the increase of the concentration of uh, PI, and this is associated mainly to the increase of the maximum interfiber space rather than the super hydrophobic character of the membrane. If we focus more on the values of the liquid interpressure of water of the nanofibrous membranes prepared without FPI and with the highest concentration of PI, we can observe the lowest liquid interpressure of water. And this is why when we use these membranes for direct contact membrane distillation, they got to it just only after some times of operation. However, the other three membranes, they worked very well without any problem. And uh, with an electrical permeate, electrical conductivity of the permeate below eight microsiemens per centimeter. Based on the permeate, obtained permeate flux, we uh, selected these two membranes for further experiments. And we observed quite stable permeate flux with quite stable electrical conductivity. The permeate flux were competitive to other design super hydrophobic nanofibrous membranes. So finally, just only to sum up, I, I would like to, to say that FPI do migrate to the surface of flat sheet, hollow fiber, and nanofiber or microfiber surfaces, rendering them more hydrophobic with an interpressure of water, robust for long-term operation of desalination by direct contact membrane distillation. And finally, just I would like to acknowledge the funds from the European Union and Spanish uh, ministries, the members of my research group, and also other researchers from other institutions. This is my email. And if you are interested in membrane science and technology, you can uh, recommend you these four books on membrane distillation, membrane modification, pre-evaporation, vapor permeation, and membrane distillation, and osmosis in detail. And thank you so much for your attention. attention. يرفع رئيس الهيئة الإشرافية العليا للمؤتمر المشرف على معهد الأمير سلطان لأبحاث البيئة والمياه والصحراء وأمين عام جائزة الأمير سلطان بن عبد العزيز العالمية للمياه الدكتور عبد الملك بن عبد الرحمن آل الشيخ وجميع الجهات المنظمة للمؤتمر والمشاركين فيه جزيل الشكر والعرفان والتقدير إلى مقام خادم الحرمين الشريفين الملك سلمان بن عبد العزيز يحفظه الله على رعايته الكريمة للمؤتمر وعلى دعمه أيده الله وسمو ولي عهده الأمين صاحب السمو الملكي الأمير محمد بن سلمان بن عبد العزيز يحفظه الله لكل ما من شأنه رفعة هذا الوطن وتقدمه وتطويره في كافة المجالات وبما يحقق أهداف رؤية المملكة 2030 يوجه رئيس اللجنة الإشرافية العليا للمؤتمر وجميع المشاركين فيه جزيل الشكر والتقدير إلى معالي وزير البيئة والمياه والزراعة المهندس عبد الرحمن بن عبد المحسن الفضلي لحضوره حفل افتتاح المؤتمر نيابة عن خادم الحرمين الشريفين الملك سلمان بن عبد العزيز يحفظه الله كما يوجه رئيس اللجنة الإشرافية العليا للمؤتمر وجميع المشاركين فيه جزيل الشكر والتقدير إلى معالي رئيس جامعة الملك سعود الأستاذ الدكتور بدران بن عبد الرحمن العمر على دعمه لكافة الأنشطة 
التي ساهمت بعد توفيق الله في نجاح المؤتمر وتميزه على الرغم من الوضع الحرج الذي تفرضه ظروف الجائحة الوبائية والاضطرار إلى استخدام وسيلة التواصل المرئي عن بعد بدلا من الأسلوب التقليدي المتبع في الدورات الثمانية السابقة كما يوجه رئيس اللجنة الإشرافية العليا للمؤتمر الشكر الجزيل لضيوف الشرف وجميع الشخصيات رفيعة المستوى والعلماء المبدعين الذين ساهموا بتقديم موضوعات ومحاضرات علمية متميزة بل أثرت المؤتمر وساهمت بشكل كبير في نجاحه وشكل هذا التجمع للنخب المتميزة ظاهرة استثنائية فريدة من نوعها ويوجه رئيس اللجنة الإشرافية العليا للمؤتمر وجميع المشاركين فيه جزيل الشكر والتقدير إلى الجهات التي دعمت المؤتمر ومنها جامعة الملك سعود وجائزة الأمير سلطان بن عبد العزيز العالمية للمياه من خلال مؤسسة سلطان بن عبد العزيز آل سعود الخيرية وشركة أراسكو الشريك الاستراتيجي وأمانة المنطقة الشرقية الراعي الذهبي كما يوجه رئيس اللجنة الإشرافية العليا للمؤتمر وجميع المشاركين فيه جزيل الشكر والتقدير إلى جميع لجان المؤتمر ومنسوب معهد الأمير سلطان لأبحاث البيئة والمياه والصحراء ومنسوب الأمانة العامة لجائزة الأمير سلطان بن عبد العزيز العالمية للمياه ومدير ومنسوب إدارة العلاقات العامة والإعلام في الجامعة ومدير وخبراء مركز التعاملات الإلكترونية في الجامعة ومؤسسة الفريق المنظم للخدمات التجارية إيفنج تروب التي نفذت المؤتمر والمعرض الافتراضي بالاعتماد على منصة في فيرز وجميع من وجميع من ساهم في الإعداد المؤتمر على كافة الجهود الكبيرة والمميزة التي بذلوها وساهمت في نجاحها وقد جرت العادة أن تتضمن الجلسة الختامية التوصيات التي تعدها اللجنة العلمية للمؤتمر بناء على ما يصله بناء على ما يصلها من المتحدثين في الجلسات العلمية إلا أن ظروف انعقاد المؤتمر بالأسلوب الافتراضي أدت إلى صعوبة تجهيز هذه التوصيات في الوقت المناسب لذلك نتوجه إلى جميع المتحدثين والعلماء والمشاركين في المؤتمر برجاء تزويدنا خلال أسبوع بتوصيتين أو أكثر تنبثق من الكلمات التي ألقوها في المحاضرات التي قدموها في هذا المؤتمر عبر البريد الإلكتروني للمعهد psiewdr@ksu.edu.sa وفي الختام وبسبب وبسبب نفس الظروف التي أشرنا إليها فإننا لم نتمكن من استقبال الأسئلة من الحضور والإجابة عليها من العلماء المحاضرين لذلك نأمل مما يرغب في من الحضور الكرام توجيه الأسئلة أن يرسل خلال أسبوع عبر البريد الإلكتروني للمعهد psiewdr at ksu.edu.sa صيغة السؤال بوضوح مع ذكر اسم المرسل وبريده الإلكتروني واسم المحاضر الذي يرغب توجيه السؤال إليه وسنعمل على توجيه هذه الأسئلة إلى المحاضرين الكرام ونأمل منهم الإجابة عليها خلال أسبوع لنتمكن من نشر الأسئلة والإجابات في موقع المؤتمر www.psiwicwrae.org لتعمل فائدة منها نستودعكم الله ونأمل أن تتعافى الأرض وجميع سكانها من هذا الوباء ومن كل داء وبلاء والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته